morning and welcome to Viewpoint, your program of personalities, politicians, and perspectives. We're going to dwell on some perspectives this morning. Going to have, your folks are going to have a good morning. Both of you sitting out there, move your chair closer to the radio now, <laughs> or turn up the volume. Uh, we always try to start uh, Viewpoint with a kudo, and we have a major kudo today, I think. You know, uh, last Sunday, the uh, Christian Church, uh, Lincoln Christian University, yes. had their annual Harvest of Talents. And all those folks who can really sing uh, stood up there and entertained us. They just knocked it out. And I was Im impressed with this one thing on the program. That has been going on for several, quite a few years now. But they have raised over two and a half million dollars for feeding folks or needy people around the world. Two and a half million dollars. I thought that was just remarkable. I'd so, call that quite a success. So we you? take off our collective hats here in the studio this morning. I couldn't get in the door with my 10-gallon hat, so I'll just take my baseball cap and tip it to you. But uh, that was a big deal. Judith Kay, we have a man who has once again acquiesced, I think would be the word, uh, to visit with us and tell us a little bit about Lincoln College and Creekside. So go right ahead, if yeah. you will, please, dear. Uh, Dr. Dennis Campbell uh, is, of course, a member of the staff at Lincoln College. We all applaud hey, there. Yes. <laughs> Uh, he's the director of Crickside. Now, compared to the age of the school, Crickside is a new endeavor for Lincoln College. And um, it's it's really something. It's an interesting th thing. And Dr. Campbell is going to tell us what Crickside is and what you can learn about it when you go out there. But first, we're going we're gonna to cover a very salient point here. <laughs> Crickside or Creekside? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Now, what would you say if you lived in Lincoln, America? Well, I come from Burton View, so I say Creekside. <laughs> oh, see, I, we said Crick, I think, in Minnesota. Well, that's what, I'm going to let anybody say it. That's what those Norwegians are known for. They can butcher up anything. <laughs> well, the part I was contending was the anytime I say something's interesting, I didn't really have any other superlatives to say about oh, it. Oh, dear so I was listening to you, Judy. There. Oh, well, so. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't minimizing Crickside at all. Well, Jim Crickside. and I were wink and have a little fun with that. So, Dear heaven, they like to pick on Norwegians, I guess, because there aren't too well, many of them around here. No one asks an East Texan, I'm from East Texas, how See, to pronounce anything so uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll go with whatever someone would say if they can remember Creekside or Creekside. Well if these boys were working in Minnesota they wouldn't be making fun of the Norwegians because there's a bunch of them up They there. are and they're big I understand too. <laughs> they, they used to say and I don't know if this is true or not that uh, when people would immigrate they would pick an area that kind of reminded them of the country that they had oh, left, I, and that makes sense. I mean, if sure. if you uh, if you were from Africa, you wouldn't want to be in Alaska. You got understand. a temperature variance there. <laughs> Did you know that, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll explain why an East Texan would be sitting up here in the north. I I know maybe you don't really consider well, yeah, Illinois. Well, yes, you're kind of a duck north. out of water too, aren't you, bud? <laughs> yes. Well, Dr. Campbell, tell us about the origination of uh, Crickside, please. Uh, well, it was out of necessity. Um, I was, I'm not sure why, uh, I, I, Tom Zorkhammer and some other people at early uh, Lincoln College uh, invited me into their fold, but back in the early 90s, um, I left Illinois State Museum and, and uh, took this wonderful position uh, to teach everything I just loved, and uh, I've been part-time teacher in almost all of the, the, the local colleges and, and elsewhere in the world even but the um, they invited me to come and teach uh, environmental biology and zoology and I noticed they didn't have a geology uh, class so I started it so <laughs> all of these sciences uh, say go outside and so I, every week I would uh, I got a bus license and started driving my students far far-flung areas like 
Funks Grove and and uh, Revis Nature Center uh, Nature Preserve, and uh, somebody had mentioned, and it was um, uh, Ron Schelling. Um, he's mm-hmm. since passed away, but a uh, wonderful person. He had mentioned to me that uh, well, Lincoln College owns some property near some creeks. Why do you have to drive so far? I think he was looking at the expense and bottom line of driving <laughs> buses more than trying to help me out. But uh, he, he had some extended family and uh, wonderful uh, farmers, and I'll even say their names, uh, the Clockingays. So uh, uh, it was Alvin and Chris Clockingay and now um, Chris's sons. But um, they showed me property, and uh, I say, well, they couldn't get me off the property once showing me that. Is that right? And it was not too far from the campus, about four no. or five miles just north mm-hmm. of um, Lincoln campus. And so this was uh, back in um, 90 must have been in 96 or, yeah 1996 and i would take my students uh, all up and down sugar creek or creek uh and I, it was a duck in water uh it, i just loved uh, being able to get out and get paid as a professor spending all the time outdoors now some of my students would worry about lions tigers and bears as they got <laughs> off the bus but uh, i was perfectly at home and as it turned out I just kept going back going back and uh, oh it was a fun thing happened in what was it 2010 is that uh, they turned over an acre to me they gave me a a, a one acre of not real good farmland to uh, to perhaps seed for I wanted a a tall grass prairie. I wanted something fairly natural, something like 80 to 90 percent of Illinois were tall grass prairies in early years, uh, so wouldn't it have been great to have one as an example in my classes? And I have a guy right in front of me right now, and in 19, uh, in uh, 2010, um, Bill Gossett, uh, well, because you couldn't separate him from our college students, he was always piling with them, uh, he, he was responsible for coming out and helping sow the seeds uh, for that prairie uh, and sent 2010 turned into 2011 uh, they gave me a sabbatical my students said they paid me to stay away um, <laughs> and so I designed other things to go in that area and that one acre turned into now 109 now most of that 109 oh is still agriculture but uh, we've gotten a lot of very nice facilities out there. locate Creekside doctor uh, uh, that's, I think we can say if we go to Bell Station, oh, which yeah. is the way going to that, this, <laughs> for you folks who drive to Hartsburg and Peoria on 155, um, go to go to Bell Station and instead of taking the curve there where all that agricultural equipment is on your left, you go right straight north and you go about a mile and a half. Whatever the road, not, uh-huh. and then you turn right on whatever county road that is, <laughs> and you go down there. And there's the Edwards Trace Road, and that goes right straight north to Creekside. Oh, it it's does. It's between it's between Nicholson Road and uh, 121. Yes, boy. You essentially, do. these locals can use words like Bell that's Station. That's not a curve. GPS. That's not a GPS direction, folks. So don't get your compass out. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, taking that old Hartsburg uh, road um, and don't make the turn. Be the one that you closed your eyes and went off the road. You went straight after yeah. going across yeah. the railroad tracks. You're now heading due, due north. Don't take that first right. It's almost immediate. Take the second right, and you can't help but see us out there. Especially now that they've removed the corn and. Uh, um, they've been harvesting that. You can see some trees in um, uh, our insect house. Now, if you were going the other way, Nicholson Road, you cross, go through Epperson Edition over Kickapoo. Uh, I like Sugar Creek better than Kickapoo. Yeah. But keep going uh, along there. Don't take the first left. Take a second left at the Red Barn, or the locals would say, don't go to Skunk Hollow, which is to the right. <laughs> so the locals know how to get there. Well, we have up there on Creekside uh, an insect hotel <laughs> That's uh, the butterflies congregate there and my guess is they don't so much as even look about paying the bill when they head south or even oh. send you a postcard we got here all right uh, <laughs> uh, but tell us about the insect house because yeah. there's a lot going on in there and the kids learn a lot and uh, it's more than just 
catching butterflies. Go ahead, Doctor. Well, no, well, that was one of the first things we envisaged that might be interesting to bring the community and also have some science going on. Uh, Lincoln Rotary gave some money, and uh, we, uh, the, the Rotarians and I, and, and volunteers from the college, uh, uh, erected a Quonset hut looking with screen over it. And we planted our prairie, but we also planted a garden and, and a flower garden and a vegetable garden inside. It wasn't necessarily going to be just native plants. And since then, we've invited everybody who, and we would provide nets out in front and say, collect anything out here in our restored prairies and the other things that have been developed and bring them in and release. Now, we didn't want wasps. We didn't want snakes, even though I don't mind them. Other people apparently shy away. Uh, we didn't want birds because they tend to eat all of our uh, visitors or the people who check into this hotel. Uh, but we invited everybody to bring in insects. Butterflies are popular, but we don't call it a butterfly house we have just as many things that eat butterflies as butterflies in there but over the years we've been raising a boatload of uh, monarchs and uh, thanks Bill because just about three weeks ago the Cloverdale 4-H group <clears throat> came out and helped um, catch the butterflies in the insectarium. We also collected some that were um, uh, flying or migrating through the area and we tagged them. And um, So we've been raising butterflies, um, monarchs, but other species in there as well. Now think about folks for just a minute uh, tagging butterflies. <laughs> they don't use a staple gun. Uh, oh, staple, that's right. staple, yeah. staple to the wings. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that in and of itself is a pretty tricky little thing. Uh, handling uh, creatures, Mother Nature's creatures that small, and uh do doctor, go right ahead. Uh, well, uh, we, we belong to a Monarch Watch program. You send a little bit of money, and they send you all, uh, uh, and you tell how many tags you want. They, they send you pre-printed tags. Uh, and on it, I have one on my phone because people always ask, how big is these uh, license plates you put on a butterfly? Tiny little um, stick-backed uh, uh, circles, no more than about a quarter inch. Do you little legs when you put them on? Uh, <laughs> there's very specific places. Is on the wings. I think they did. You know, where, where did your tax money go? Somebody de uh, determined exactly where on a wing could you put a little bitty tag that doesn't affect the aerodynamics of flying to yeah. Mexico. Yeah. Um, and and, and w there's three lines on it. Uh, there's a, a, a letters and numbers uh, very specific that are um, to our uh, collecting. And we apply them very specifically on a hind wing across a couple of veins so it's not just sticking onto scales. And we assume that when you do that nicely and carefully and you release them, they fly away. Uh, and they get oriented and head off to Mexico. Now, this is the last brood. We had we raised three broods inside the insectarium. They have no interest in flying to Mexico. They just want to They mate. like it there. They'll sit there and die there. They will. And, uh -huh. and mate. And, uh -huh. and, and have their eggs and caterpillars and chrysalises and more adults. And they do that about two times or three times. And then it's that last brood that not interested in mating. Uh, they just want to fly and their genetics what a nature shames <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, seriously sure uh, migration these dog gun butterflies go clear to mexico now do they take they, they cross the border where that bridge is or they go across the, the, the goal uh well i'm not getting it i know a, a viewpoint should have politics in it but i'm going to stay away from the political uh landmine you just gave me there bill but uh they fly irrespective uh, i the way we watch it the wind pretty much directs them but they they then have to uh they rest and that's why i'm sure many people have seen uh, them clustering uh uh in of September, early October, because they're resting behind trees, trying to get the winds to die down, trying to get the, the rain to die down, and perfect weather condition, they're back up into the sky, heading off south. And they go through Texas. Now, there is a, a Pacific Coast migration, too, uh, that go to very similar mountain ranges uh, in one area of Mexico, but these are heading down to um, central, uh, and kind of west central Mexico, to a mountain range. Nature's Migratory patterns are just oh, I'm amazing. Amazed. I saw something, and I wish I could tell you what it was, a bird from South America to Norway, Judith, us, and, oh. and showed the flight path. That's oh, a heck of a flight. Oh, oh it yeah. would be. Yeah. yeah. It's just, 
uh, migratory habits of the animals are What's beyond the, our can. The genetics, the yeah. DNA. What is the lifespan of a monarch, generally speaking? That depends upon whether you've stapled it too hard or not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, how many? Because there are other mar uh, people who are tagging them. I, I kind of wonder um, if you catch a butterfly in Texas and you're going to put your your tag on it. If there's already a tag, how many can your traveling suitcase uh, hold uh, tags? But um, the lifespan. Uh, uh, Let's say we start with an egg, and egg will be in the egg stage about yeah. uh, 10 days, and then they hatch into caterpillars, and the caterpillars, as you know, uh, get bigger and bigger with more and more food, like the milkweeds that they're feeding on, and we call them instar stages or nymph stages. They they will shed their skin, and they get larger and larger in shedding, and, and that is another two two weeks, so from 10, 10 days of egg, maybe two weeks, caterpillars go from just tiny little caterpillars you can't even see to gigantic ones that uh, you they get larger and larger uh, they get off the uh, after about two weeks as caterpillar get off of the milkweed and go walk about for a while they don't and then they start forming a chrysalis a, a cocoon mm -hmm. a word we use for butterfly cocoons and they stay in there for another two weeks and then the, the last <laughs> I, I sometimes make the mistake thinking it's longer but the uh, last hour or two hours they almost turn completely black and clear you can see through them and see the orange and black inside the chrysalis and then immediately they they swell up and break through and is an adult and it, the first couple of broods would live about two weeks so it, if we start with adults we're two weeks um, a chrysalis was that have been about two weeks um, a uh, caterpillar would have been about two weeks and then um, eggs was a bit, little bit less I hope you're paying attention, folks. We're, <laughs> gonna, we're gonna have a pop quiz in this. Oh. Uh, we uh, we know where you are out there. Uh, and the, to give you a chance to catch up on your notes, we'll uh, catch up with our sponsors right now. Go right ahead, James. Right back live in the studios here in WLCN. High on the Windy Hill, County Road 2250. The program, of course, is Viewpoint, appearing each Wednesday morning, 0815 to 0900 hours. We try to bring you interesting guests, <laughs> and I think for the most part we succeed. We certainly have succeeded this morning in bringing with us uh, Dr. Uh, Dennis Campbell, uh, professor at Lincoln College, and director of Creekside or Crickside, just depends on which side of the fence you're on there. Uh, that's one of nature's real wonders for us to have here at Golden County, Judith. Uh, many people have already been up to Creekside, and uh, is, while it's private ground, uh, it's not excluded. We doctor would be glad to have visitors and tell them about Creekside. Um, if you can catch him and slow him down enough from digging in the hole or doing some <laughs> manual labor. Uh, the uh, be careful here. Anyway, I'm just going to come out and say it. Doctor uh, has cons considered considerable of his own treasure up there. Not only working up there, but uh, some of his out-of-pocket expenses uh, directly to the benefit of the students at Lincoln College. And uh, for that, I'd off my hat to you, sir. Uh, these kids that, have, that take science courses under you, uh, they're entitled, they're, they're, they have a treat. They really do. Uh, one thing that Creekside is noted for, we'll touch to Willie Mammoth before it gets out of the room, is Judge Tusk. The elephant so, in the room. Is that uh, how you, so, aren't you So clever? go right ahead with that, Doctor. Oh, well, a, a number of things. Um, uh, thanks, Bill. Um, uh, I'm a retired professor. Uh, I tend to like to call myself a caretaker now. They like the word director of Creekside. Um, I like to play. I'm an old man now playing in the creek. When I was a little kid, I played in the creek, too. But um, I, 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 the, the idea of, say, expenses, um, I think... He, all teachers are blessed and we need to recognize at every level because of they devote not only their time and energy but many many resources they have in the class come from their their pockets so it's not just say me or higher levels of, of a college it is the lowest living uh, level of teaching leads to higher levels so m my hat is off to every teacher well said sir it's one of those professions well we, we don't 
don't value enough. Uh, and and uh, Judy and I were talking a little bit earlier. Her her daughter will even be a professional people. They have a home to be an adjunct professor or a teacher in some situations. So I certainly encourage all of that. Now, you, you had mentioned a, a, a mammoth. Um, I think one of the reasons uh, Creekside is so important to the world is the, of an accident that happened back in, um, it would have been in 2005, um, the um, uh, accidental discovery of, of the world's largest woolly mammoth. Um, so it's not mm -hmm. the largest mammoth, there were several other species, but the woolly mammoths wandering around, um, especially if you got listeners here in, uh, near Atlanta, we had a a big glacier kind of stopped here and receded back uh, well out in front of the glacier mammoths were roaming around uh, 15 10,000 years ago and uh, Judd named after the student who found it uh, Lincoln College woolly mammoth was discovered and uh, again it was in an area that uh, my students and I were working with freshwater mussels uh, about a mile from where Creekside is at this moment or the entrance to Creekside. So yeah, so we've, we've done Pleistocene mammal looking ever since and not only mammoths but other things. Uh -huh. Tell us what is a freshwater mussel, sir? <laughs> okay, of all the uh, things. We, uh, big uh, try, mammoths, try to avoid the scientific clams. description. <laughs> it's an old clam. Uh, people are familiar if you walk to Creeks and you find a dead clam shell and you pick it up, try to skip it off across the water uh, they're very important in the, the freshwater systems the, their filter feeders uh, I, I'm really a cave biologist there are not a lot of caves in this area and so there's a, a scientist at the Illinois State Museum um, Bob Warren who said well, why don't you study the clams uh, in the local creeks with your students instead of trying to find caves and so uh, we've been we've been doing freshwater mussel clam studies ever since so uh, one of my labs they were looking for clams and pulled out an elephant um, uh, 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 bones um, uh, tusks teeth and by the way that tusk is on display for people to see at our Heritage Museum. Uh, it, it's still in the library. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon. It's we, in the library. The intent yes. was to, to, mm -hmm. to send it over to the Lincoln College Heritage Museum, but um, uh, it, it's so big and we had to take out an entire wall to get it into that building. And um, So it's very fine where, where it rests is just fine. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to see the world's largest woolly mammoth tusks mm -hmm. and tooth and other uh, material. It was uh, donated to the Illinois State Museum. So other materials that have been found since is at the Research and Collection Center of the State Museum. Doctor, in your studying your research days, you went to Australia, and you did what down there? <laughs> well, Cave diving? The, the way I tell people is I tried to get as far from Dallas as I could uh, when I was younger, and the, the, I drew a line through the center of the earth, and it appeared in the South Pacific. But the reality was I was doing research uh, in caves, uh, the the energy flow in cave systems by, I, and it's not very sexy, but uh, I dealt with cave crickets um, that uh, feed and come back into caves. And, and, and so esoteric uh, scientific research, Carlsbad, Texas, New Mexico, Mexico, and then had an offer I couldn't refuse, which was to do my doctorate in uh, Sydney, Australia. So uh, after getting it, my working all over the South Pacific and New Zealand and New Guinea and Australia, um, ended up staying there and working for the Australian Museum and and uh, other life experiences uh, kind of sent me back to the United States. So, uh, well, you've been out of town, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> down under, down under is yes. the way I, I say about yes. caving. Are also. there many caves in this area? They are, but they just can't get to them because they're below the, the glacial till or the gravel we have on top. We have some limestone about 300 feet below us that have caves in them, but there's no entrance into them. So we go to Missouri. Now, uh, you talk about caves. Uh, how would how would you ever get to 
those? Well, uh, it's the accidents. Uh, caves develop underneath the ground. Now, there are many types of caves, but the most common is limestone caves, and it's the acids in water that make a little crack yeah. larger and larger over thousands of years. And it's only accidental, Judy, that um, that it gets close to the surface and uh, you have an entrance. Well, what you said that that's that's actually your your <laughs> focus is cave biology, right? Uh, uh, my early research, uh, uh -huh. my doctorate and, and early, my master's degree. And what, early do you, what do you find in a cave that you don't find uh, on Kickapoo Street? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, done? Well, uh, I'm afraid <laughs> Bill is looking at me. He's going to psychoanalyze me uh, <laughs> um, about why I would be interested in, in, in caves. But uh, I, um, we use it as a laboratory. It's one of those natural uh, situations in the world that all the n uh, natural rules of nature take place but it's in a kind of a lab setting. You got walls and ceilings and floors and you can monitor things going in, you can monitor things going out. So it's the perfect laboratory for a biologist. And if you allow organisms to develop and to change genetically uh, underneath the ground in this laboratory, wouldn't it be interested to study it? So I've been doing it. Do you do you uh, follow an evolution of things? Things then when you go into a cave? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not old enough to be able to watch evolution. Evolution usually occurs over hundreds of thousands of generations of the animal, but you go into different caves, you see different levels of, mm -hmm. of, of evolution. You bet. And that's exactly, I, I worked with um, some of the internal physio physiology of cave animals and how it's different in other populations that are just genetically similar. And how is it different? Oh well, because we call it regressive evolution in that uh, there are certain structures and functions um, that uh, are lost over generation. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of generations. Mm -hmm. You'll lose eyes, you'll lose pigment, you'll get much more attenuated or longer appendages, you get sensory mechanisms like hairs, and all of these are basic characteristics that you can find on a lot of different cave animals and it's fun to think about how that might be in different caves at different levels of those. So it's really evolves from one type of animal into a complete other animal. It is, uh, but, but, but with other species in between there. It's not a change overnight. Uh -huh. No. It, it, and it's it's uh, individual species that are off doing what species do, which is reproduce and have their lives. And then uh, their genetics, if you happen to get, we use here in North America, talk about the ice ages, tend to um, kind of lock animals uh, that are pre adapted, those that like to be underneath logs and in do uh, dark, moist areas are perfect to get accidentally locked up into a cave somewhere <coughs> and to evolve characteristics after many, many generations. D does, does one animal um, consort with another type and form a, th a whole third type of, of animal? That can happen if they're very close related. We call those hybrids, and many hybrids can't even reproduce because they are different species that might make an individual. You might have uh, heard of lions and tigers uh, being forced to have offspring, but they're, they're are not fertile offspring. They can't have individuals of their own. Well, um, the, um, um, so some animals can be like that the way we like to say it is genetic genes change over time and they because they're isolated from other reproducing populations especially caves is a good example uh, you might be the same species in another cave but given a hundred thousand generations you're not passing on your genetics back and forth yeah. so you develop your own because of some chance circumstances and when chance is being supported by whether you live or die uh, without eyes and without pigment, uh, there are other energies inside of a body that can be directed to be survived. So a chance mutation uh, might survive in a cave where it would not survive. A blind 
depigmented animal on the surface has got a lot of things working against it. For those of you, well, aren't you well, good at yeah. finding all this science in this, Judy? <laughs> Some of you may be planning to meet us at Daphne's at uh, uh, nine thirty. There, we'll have the pop quiz there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, doctor, uh, doctor. Doctor will pass out the quiz. They used to give me money to give information. Now I got to remember. I just should be out there mowing. At <laughs> well, that's the very reason Doctor Dennis Campbell is with us this morning. <laughs> Uh, fountain of information, 648-5510. Now, no question is stupid, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. If they're stupid, he'll just wink at me and say, yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> I've never heard of a stupid question. Seriously, uh, uh, Dr. Campbell is a treasure for those youngsters attending Lincoln College, and those who come under his tutelage are indeed very lucky students, and I mean that very sincerely, Dennis. Um, so feel free to ask any questions you have about Doctor, don't ask him about commuting back and forth to Springfield, which he does daily, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, that's that's another dedication. So he is a director of Creekside or Crickside. I don't care how, however you want to pronounce it. It's just fine with us. Uh, doctor, uh, tell us about the other features that we have up there besides our insect hotel, which is really rather phenomenal. Uh, and at the same time, we should uh, nod our head in the direction of Rotary, who has done a considerable amount of work up there. The members have been on their hands and knees putting in uh, uh, w wooden walkways and so forth. So go right ahead, oh, well, th This is coming from a Rotarian. Uh, <laughs> Bill is a Rotarian, so uh, we have a meeting today. Um, thanks for mentioning that, because uh, all of this will be on display um, a weekend after this coming one on October 23rd on Saturday. Uh, a post following uh, COVID restrictions. I lost two Earth Days and one Fall Festival uh, because of COVID. We weren't able to have because of the very smart reasoning of, of restricting activities there with people. Uh, and uh, on October 23rd, just about 10 days or so away, we're going to have um, a, a fall festival. And you can come out and see the insectarium, even though there's still a couple of butterflies and some insects in there, but most have been tagged and released. But we, we have a, a pavilion, we have fire pits, we got trails, we got a boardwalk. Uh, so we will be having, uh, trying to have people come out and we call it a walk on the wild side uh, that probably is uh, the trademarked so uh, maybe I need to change it walk on the creek side yeah uh, wild side's a little uh, uh, maybe may, may a stretch uh, yes uh, that's right well um, but we, we uh, I have this wonderful work study student this year but I've had them in the past but uh, Nicole Kenny is is very excited she started working with some Bobcat uh, evidence and so she's doing a project with Bobcat so we want to introduce that. We want to show people a, a mammoth materials, uh, freshwater mussels. Uh, we have forest uh, and prairies. Uh, it, it's, it would be perfect for the family. We got activities for the kids. Uh, so on October 23rd, thanks for asking about Creekside. We want to show everybody. And your hours for your... Oh, thank you. Uh, 10 to 3. So it's a, a very modest amount of time. Who knows what weather will be like on October October 23rd. Well, right. <laughs> but uh, we're hoping that uh, it would be good enough people could put on a sweater. Maybe it's not going to be raining, and we'll have wonderful activities for them. The kids, we have a simulated archaeological pit right by our log cabin out there. Uh, we're going to, at 1030, at the beginning, we want to dedicate that uh, rotary peoples of the past boardwalk now you talk about your archaeological pit yes what uh, what uh, describe that please and thank you <laughs> well um, it, it, it's a an area where about five six years ago I dug down three feet and then salted and scattered a whole bunch of uh, Native American Indian artifacts to tell stories uh, you just everything you've ever heard about somebody digging up in an archaeology pit it, I found an example of and put it down there. Then put a foot of soil on it, and then found some pioneer, uh, some old uh, colonial type of colonization of this area of Illinois objects, and then some modern day objects on top. So this is a whole lot of soil that we've dug down in little squares. We use archaeological techniques of of lines and and trowels, and we invite 
people to sit there and, and dig and, and discover uh, objects that have been there for over six, maybe seven years. And so it's fun on the techniques. So we're illustrating techniques. Now we also have a swimming pool with sand and little kids can dig up little objects too. They'll have fun digging up in the sand. Were there many Indians in this oh, area? Very much so. They, they were moving through, uh, there's a long, probably 12,000 years of oh Indian occup uh, occupation in the area. The, most of that time was nomads moving through the area, migratory uh, Native American Indians. But the boardwalk is fun because a every two feet along the, the boardwalk, uh, you go back a year in time. And so we have little metal uh, plaques that were, that students in the area and teachers, uh, the, the uh, Lincoln Women's Cl uh, Club, uh, the Lincoln Rotary, and some other organizations have paid for these little plaques and so you're going back in time so we have a Kickapoo Indian area the overlook that looks out over the creek is so far uh, about a, uh, 800 feet that uh, is Mississippian Indian so if you've seen a ceremonial mound building at at Cahokia, we have a simulated building there that overlooks the creek. So yes, um, the uh, Native American Indians were in the area and, and right there on Lincoln College property. We've discovered quite a lot of Indian artifacts. Is that right? Just as like many farmers. Just tell us about a couple of those articles, if you would. Oh, well, the um, we'll get your spear points and uh, you get uh, mm -hmm. smaller uh, arrow points, which mm -hmm. we call bird points. But uh, I had one student, uh, two students, a few years ago, found a celt, which is a found grooveless a axe. A celt, C-E-L-T, a grooveless axe, beautiful thing for that they would haft and put it into a, a, a wooden handle. We've had grooved axes, uh, uh, heads, a uh, rock out there. Um, a wonderful person, uh, Mandy Cordray, who, who takes off from her work whenever she can and roams the, the the countryside there has found um, a, a discoidal, which was a chunky stone, which was a game piece. Uh, we've had uh, scrapers and uh, wonderful Indian artifacts that represent almost every way of life. Of Does humans. it amaze you as oh. you look through these things? You know, we think of the people that we're speaking of right now as being... Um, incompetent, you know, oh. <laughs> that they just kind oh. of existed here until the woolly mammoth stomped them or something. Oh. But uh, do they amaze you at the things that they figure out to make their life more bearable? <laughs> well, it's fun to think about that. The toolkit that a, 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 a group of people who have to contend with woolly mammoths, but the cave bear, uh, the, uh, the short-faced bear that might be behind them, or saber-toothed tigers. Uh, all of these existed in our area because we're finding bones of mammoths and mastodons and ground sloths and, and musk ox and, and bison. All of that's coming from that creek from our studies. But uh, I agree with you. It's amazing that uh, people survived for yeah. not just <clears throat> I have trouble getting through my 70 years of life and my own existence, but spending hundreds and thousands of years looking over your shoulder, you better know what you're doing. Uh, well, I Yes. <laughs> what what was the lifespan? Do you figure of the people that uh, were here at Crickside first? Well, that's don't know for sure, but I think an older person would be in their thirties or forties. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know. Just think of that. I know yeah. there wouldn't be a lot of gray-haired people. You wouldn't think. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> why, why is he sitting here looking at me when he says, <laughs> or me, <laughs> or me? Uh, yes. Uh, no. The uh, I would say twenties and thirties would be uh, pretty much. Well, at what for, age then do you think they uh, they reproduced? I mean, you'd have to, in order to raise your kids and only live to be 20 or 30, you got to get busy. Well I, <laughs> well, I think the biological systems, kind of uh, the species themselves and their genetics will determine that. Uh, As the expression I, goes, this too shall pass. <laughs> well, I, 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 I can't ha hazard a guess on this, but I, I would think reproductive age would be 15, uh -huh. 14 or 15, and then, as we know, it can even be younger than that. Um, but um, the... Uh, uh, very short life as an adult, I would say, uh -huh. um, uh, is is really. But you know, six four eight five five one zero. Your time is running out, folks. 
Uh, we're not going to be graded on any questions. <laughs> we'll, we'll just accept your questions as they come. Our guest this morning is, as you might have figured, if you've been listening at all, shame on you if you didn't, uh, 648-5510, Dr. Dennis Campbell. Uh, we always love to have Dennis with us in the studio because uh, a fountain of knowledge and uh, always very gracious in presenting himself for for, for examination. <laughs> Go ahead, Judith. You were, uh, oh, I thought you had a piece of paper there that you were going to wave in front of me. So I will... Well, I can if you'd like. All right, you go right, you go right ahead. I defer. She owns fifty-one percent of the show, Doctor. Oh. So, so you, oh, you must. Didn't I tell you about dead mics? That doesn't. That's not allowable. Oh well, yeah, yeah. That's not what we're paid for, is it? Mm-hmm. No, th- this is just a, a communication to me. Oh, I see. It just right. happens okay. to be in my lap. Uh, if there were one suggestion you could make to a, a newly arriving studio uh, or a student in September and they walk in your classroom for their first day, <laughs> what would you tell them, doctor? Well, well, they would say, what the heck are you doing there, Dr. Campbell? You retired. <laughs> but I, I would say the curiosity. After being an old person now, I wasted those college years. I should have taken not just science courses, but art and business. Um, I I think that that real life uh, liberal education that Lincoln College provides, mm-hmm. not only a good beginning, we used to say for two years, now that we have bachelor's degrees and even master's degrees, uh, not only a good beginning, we're a good middle and a good end, I would just take early years and explore courses. Uh, pick the minds of, of divergent people um, that, uh, and uh, and you sure have an occupation in mind, and maybe you can contribute to that. Can you, Dennis, please uh, reiterate the celebration you're having on the 23rd of this month so that people can make a note at home and sure. plan to go? October 23, a Saturday, um, not this weekend, but next, uh, 10 to, to 3. Uh, oh, you can text or uh, email. Uh, my first initial last name so it's d campbell at lincolncollege.edu and we're going to have some uh, media uh, announcements and some flyers around but uh, try to find creekside four miles north of campus uh, north of the town but uh, yes uh, 10 to 3 on october 23. i'll be there by george how about you willie bill if i'm sober Uh, (laughs) dr campbell We've, Dr. Dennis Campbell has been our guest this morning on Viewpoint. As always, oh, it's always you. a joy to have uh, Dennis with us. Uh, we know we're going to get something that we didn't know about before. <laughs> uh, and that's that, that's why we're here at Viewpoint. Dennis, thank you very much for spending your time with us this morning. Thank you. You're wonderful people. I'll be here anytime. You're